my name is Paul. Um, I graduated from Edinburgh University's GIS course in 2010. Before that, I've been doing work within the normally international development and humanitarian response sector. Um, and as Helen maybe touched upon at the start of the day, most of my job, I really feel, is just advocating for people to think spatially and understand the concepts of one geography and acting that way. Um, so within international development, there's the usual three schools of playing with natural resource development, public health, which is where I sort of began, and, um, and rural development. Uh, as we moved back to uh, the sort of more industrialized nations, smart cities became sort of fourth topic in that, which I'll touch upon later. And uh, most of I've, most of my mission that I've been doing is um, around building resilience uh, and helping a transition towards a low carbon economy, which is why for the keen eyed people amongst us, they would see that my logo is actually the Cahill projection or the Waterman butterfly projection. And the butterfly is actually a symbol of resilience and green apparently is the color of resilience. Um, so a lot of the things that I've done over the last 12 years with GeoGeo has been mostly trying to promote within government communities and other international NGOs the sort of best practices within GIS and to help build predominantly open source solutions for usually web and mobile applications. Uh, but from day one, um, particularly when I started joining the fixed wing drone game in 2013, um, it has been really to be breaking game engines to see if they were ever capable of taking the kind of geospatial data sets that they produce. And actually it was only really when Unreal Engine upgraded last December that we started to see this new opportunity. So this talk today is about the rise of the game engines. And um, I guess to start with, we're all quite geeky here, I assume, but you know, who want to show of hands, who here would identify as a gamer? Just a wee raise of hands. Board games count. Warhammer and Games Workshop, painting figures, that counts, that counts. Um, I would, and um, I'm going to try and make the argument that game engines are not too dissimilar from the world that we love and know in GIS. Uh, oh, that's not going to do it. Oh, okay. So what are game engines? Um, there'll be some interactive testing throughout this, for, especially for those identified as gamers. And for those who don't, this is the greatest football game ever made, Sensible Soccer, made right here in Scotland, specifically in Dundee. But you can break down game engines to me into three simple pillars. One, you've got the physics side of it, the actual ability for you to hard code the way that um, actors and agents will interact with their environment. It's not too dissimilar from what we did in Edinburgh with agent-based modeling and tearing our hair out with learning Java and object-oriented programming. Um, the other thing that it brings is similar to simulation, which is to be able to animate these uh, features and actors and assets, as well as create other amazing animations that belong into other games, like to give an immersive kind of atmosphere. And the third pillar, which if you're a geospatial kid that falls down a rabbit hole into game engines, you will absolutely become addicted to, is the one thing the GIS can't do, which is sing back to you. And the audio processing within game engines, when coupled with GIS data, creates this love for location-based sound that, you know, if you do want to begin this world, uh, I would recommend that you probably learn a lot about that. Um, this talk's not going to be very technical. This is going to be in code. If you want to learn more about the, the things um, that I'm talking about, there's the University of YouTube, or as Amy also uh, acknowledged, the Stack Overflow, which are great places. Discord is also really good, especially because most of the plugins that come with these game engines have their own Discord channel. So there's a thriving online community. And um, because we're in Glasgow, it's easy for me to break it down. In the world of game engines, unless your name's Rockstar North and you've decided to build your own engine in-house, there's the Celtic and Rangers. And I'll try not to show my side of that story, but Unreal Engine will give you free access to all of their game engines completely for free until you make that first million dollars and then they'll take a little slice. Unity, you almost have to pay at the gates to get in, but you also, by doing so, welcome yourself to a whole list of other functions and plugins and assets. So there really are two. Um, I went with Unreal Engine because for me, it's the closest to the open source side of things, more so than Unity for having to pay the door. And when you look at the applications that 
been using. I'm not trying to make a million dollar game, really. Um, but yeah, so we'll move on to the evolution and why this opportunity is starting to appear. Uh, anyone shout out the name of this character? Zelda? No, close, but it's Zelda. The far one on the left was actually the 1982 flip game of Zelda, the first game ever with a continue button as we move all the way through the years to the modern stuff and all 3D assets. But the power of computer processing has really exploded, particularly in the last few years with too many crypto bros in the world using graphics cards and hogging them all up to do some mining. But now we're sitting at a place where these are really um, low cost for, for anyone to start adopting and having the ability to run these game engines. The other aspect that really drove that was just that human endeavor for us to experience things in a more real and realer, that word, um, uh, manner than we have before. And our thriving and desire for realism has been also at the core of how the community has grown as well. And of course, the data or geodata availability. I say data as well because it's unbelievable the amount of people around the world that are bringing free assets into this world. I'm going to show an example of Scotland, but I had no idea there were some hobbyists sitting on the eyeless sky doing like high res 4K imagery of just simple rocks. You know, and when you're working in the same biogeography, this has become an amazing opportunity to leverage. Yeah the efforts that are happening on a global scale. Um, never mind the other aspects of making human characters, animals, unicorns, chickens. It's been an explosion in the last few years with that opportunity that's come from graphics cards being democratized. So the best part about this is really the introduction of geography and the idea that digital geography can now start entering the game world. Um, I'm going to start with this slide because I'm kind of sick of seeing New York in a game engine. We get it. Their open street map is the best. They've got some great 3D data sets and they've got some great photogrammetry that's available for free. And everyone that starts on, especially on the University of YouTube, will be using the New York data set as their sort of gateway into this world. Um, but there's also been um, a huge amount of benefits from bringing in the geospatial world in terms of using games to create something that is recognizable to you as a world. It's one thing to make an immersive experience that feels real, but it's still about zombies and a made up land that's been drawn by a, an amazing artist. But here we're dealing with real world geographies that brings in an entirely different human experience of how we immerse ourselves into that world and interact with it. And as I like to argue, then contribute to our understanding of it. And with that is also open the door for real world applications. So um, I'm going to touch upon a few of those and a few of my favorites within that space. And we're going to play a game called Guess Where That Place Is. Okay, so we'll start nice and easy. Where are we? Spoiler alert, all of these slides are not real world pictures. They're all game engine photos, please. Yeah, it's yes, it's the old man of store in the Isle of Sky. Um, one of the first people I or first teams I ever heard speak about the role of geospatial within a game engine is the creators of Assassin's Creed, Ubisoft. And they've been going around both hiring, curating, and actually in some cases doing the work themselves of scanning the physical and human world. And credit where credit's due, if they had not scanned St. Paul's Cathedral before it burnt down for an Assassin's Creed game, then the architects would not know how to rebuild it again now that it did burn down. So there are actually really valuable things, but even though they didn't know they were doing it, this was from a game called Valhalla, which talks about Dalriada and the end of the Viking era. And it has real world locations of Stavanger, which is where I was raised when I was a kid and the Isle of Sky. And so you're actually walking through this world, getting to learn and discover the way in which the Celts and the Vikings were interacting. And for me, without even doing it, they just created a, a generation of people that now more, know more about the Vikings than I learned in this very archaeological department doing archaeology of Vikings. Um, so that ability for us to use game engines as a form of storytelling to help describe real world places and real world phenomena is, is really good. I should say as a caveat this, before geographic data really got involved, UN themselves actually published a list of games which they felt 
helped users, predominantly Western users, experience things that they would otherwise not experience. There was a game called um, this, this War of Ours, which was a survival game that put you in the, the, the shoes of three random people that were in a war at a time inside a house. And your job was to make choices to try and survive or like salvage what you can with psychological repercussions for all of those actions. And there were many games that were put in that. The very first immersive VR thing was um, a, a team of women, uh, sorry, a team led by a woman in New York that was immersivevr.com. And the first two launches they had was, one was just the sound of uh, bombing in Gaza Strip, but it put you in the market before you were there. And another one, which became a I Am A Man project, which was you are walking through 1950s America being treated as an African-American as you walk down the street. And it was a very emotional and kind of uh, like immersive experience that really put people into a world that they otherwise might not have experienced in the first place. So my first real interest in game engines came from this, uh, just from my own experiences playing games and the other things that we were hearing from more international development uh, organizations and things. Digital twins, AKA the latest catchphrase for smart cities, which I don't know how many how smarter it can get in the UK. I mean, the good thing about doing international development is that you get to experience a vast array of countries. I've, I've now worked and helped over 60 different countries, predominantly in Latin America, Sub-Saharan Africa and Asia, but it's not like I ignore the UK and Scotland. In fact, that's why I moved back to Glasgow in 2013 was to, as the co-author of the Future City Glasgow Future City Demonstrator Project, where our job was to help spend 24 million pounds in 12 months inside the council to see if we can create a smart city. And um, does anyone want to take a guess which city this is? Right side of the world, it's Singapore. And the reason I'm using the example of Singapore and not a single city in the UK is because Singapore took a much braver and proactive stance in removing the silos that we so enjoy in the UK between our public and private uh, sectors. And that helped not only create a beautiful 3D world of Singapore, but actually add in all the data um, that was necessary to make the effective development planning application work. Best example is um, energy utility, transport, all of these things. Like if you forced Scottish Power and SSE with all their smart meters on everyone's apartments, to share all of that data so that you have one building that has one reading, now you're starting to touch upon where Singapore is already at. Whereas, and of course we were discussing about broadband, I live in the West End of Glasgow and I'm being attacked by the sky from BT and underneath by City Fiber. And I was laughing at them saying, I'm so glad the Romans built the roads and I wish they'd just been around to build the broadband because then we just have one company to do it and there would be no fights or never mind cables going everywhere. But obviously this is a really important application because of the main things around physics and simulation abilities as well. The idea that there are now simple plugins to add in, uh, internet of things sensors as well. So you have the, the trifecta of imagery from the sky, data if you can remove the silos, and then the sensors being brought all together into a game engine that can allow that to be visualized and published onto a wide variety of things, everything from augmented reality um, to just interactive game worlds. So in terms of the most serious application that you will see being developed from a geospatial sector, I really feel that Digital Twins is, is definitely that. But as I'm just a sort of small consultancy that works in development, I don't really get to play with a lot of the big engineering teams that have huge departments doing this at the moment. But it is one of my favorite sort of things to keep an eye on. And I don't like to use the word Esri at a Phosphor G conference, but I, I usually avoid their solutions because they still stick with the silos, but they are also developing a lot of SDKs predominantly with digital twins and development in mind. Um, does anyone know which island this is? It was made famous this story last year because they've, be they've become the first island to have an entire island placed into a game engine and then hosted onto a cloud. This is the island of Tuvalu, which will be the first island to disappear. And yes, they've been given land in America for their future generations, their own kids and grandkids to live, 
But the sad reality is they've had to create a digital twin in a virtual space so that their grandkids will be able to visit that space on the digital world to share um, and learn about their heritage and culture. Because in the world that we live in, it's a reality for a majority section of the world that there's huge impacts coming their way. And I think this is probably one of the most tragic examples I've heard of the use of a game engine. Um, but it also showcases what is a low hanging fruit. I mentioned Unreal Engine and my love for that. They're run by Epic Games. Epic Games, if you want kids, own Fortnite. Fortnite is a virtual world that's quite big, made by an artist, not by a geographer. Um, but it allows up to 100, 150 people to hang out. That hanging out is free. You build a world, you have a free method for having that in a virtual space, mm -hmm. thanks to the donation of that code from Epic Games themselves. And that's exactly what is, being, is gonna happen here as well. So it is about conserving our heritage, conserving our culture. And my example is actually based on archeology, span which is another fine example of how we can combine both the educational aspects and the conservation aspects as well. Particularly if you have a coastline or in Scotland's case, lots of rabbits, which kind of destroys archeology span as well. So that helps me move swiftly on to my project. So back in 2018 in a pub in Glasgow in the South Side, my friend said archeology span for the National Trust who decided he wanted to hire a helicopter for an extortionate price for a pretty coarse data set. And I did not really think I would be flying fixed wing drones in the Hebrides of Scotland. But when I told him the level of resolution that we can capture with, I fly the SenseFly EB, I have done for 10 years, it's autonomous, it's fixed wing, and the Aviation Authority said I could fly over cities and highways as soon as I started without asking anyone's permission. But we took it here in 2018 for five glorious days in November, um, a rare one as we're experiencing today, to digitize the entire island data set. With that imagery, we were, allowed, we were enabling the archaeologists and ourselves to use permanent QGIS to go ahead and digitize archaeology 5,000 years worth of human history in the making. Um, we had, there were some parts of the island itself that are inaccessible. So the National Trust Rangers had never been to some parts of this island. There's amazing history here. We're talking about the world, well, the UK's first monastery and nunnery. The King of Norway is buried there. And it once was a thriving population of 500, now whittled down to just 15. But we were able to capture over and digitize over 2,000 features of this island um, that was amazing for them. But archaeologists being archaeologists, as soon as lockdown happened, I had to ask the question, what have you done with the data? And the correct answer was print it and still have it on one person's laptop that has QGIS. Um, and so really it was lockdown that kind of helped spawn this uh, desire for the National Trust to look at virtual tourism, which we started very simply. I can build a 3D mesh from the original point cloud, upload it to Sketchfab. We can add some narration, um, which was a Margaret Faye Shaw interview from 1945, talking about the island, as well as places of interest that we can animate around. It's very simple, it could be done in VR, could be done in augmented reality, but the dream was, can you just give all the GIS data back and put it into a game engine with the amazing terrain data that we captured and then create the world as it was a thousand years ago? And of course we could use it to make a digital twin for development planning purposes, but if they want that, they're gonna have to hire me twice or you get one choice, not two. Um, and so we, we set about doing this. We are now using 5.2, um, but the demo that I'm going to show you today is from 5.1. Um, also, what happened this year is that the few of the plugins became free. So the one I'm using is called Landscaping, and there was another one out there called Terraform. And these are dedicated plugins that have been converting Python to C++ to help us import, uh, not geo packages, shapefiles, sorry. And, and raster terrain data sets. Um, but it's still at the point where we are pushing it right to its limit because you have platforms like Cesium or Cesium Ion 
which uses coarse radar SRTM based terrain data sets for the whole world. And you can take that whole globe and plug it straight in to Unity or Unreal. And you've got the whole world to play with. But anyone that's been wandering around Scotland knows that if you want to justify the terrain, you, you don't use satellites or anything. You want a drone based or manned aircraft based terrain at five centimeters really to capture it. And we ultimately had to make it coarser and coarser and we got to about 50 centimeters. And uh, yeah, we had to make a compromise because this is 21 square kilometers that we're talking about mapped with the drone. I think my record with PCs is the SRUC's um, future farming system. And that was 25 square kilometers. After that, you need the EPCC to really start doing this kind of stuff. And even then you'll be breaking Unreal Engine. So we ended up starting things the GIS way. So like every other game world in the GIS world, you start with the terrain and the raster data and you move on up. Land use, I use some open street map data, but game engines will expose data sets derived from satellite imagery because you notice when you're walking through a world when a, sat when a river is just not lined perfectly to the, the actual hydrology. We then digitized around 300 lazy beds or uh, run rigs. And we got about 250 shielings, which are the kind of squares there because we, we started with polygons with the shielings and then we made that, I used central geoids to make it points and then categorize the shielings into various scales of sizes because shielings are just round huts. We had then black houses, uh, rectangular structures, but we kept them as polygons before putting it into Unreal Engine because we wanted the orientation would really mattered in front of that and also helped with the size of it. And then you had things like open street map land use, so beaches and um, woodland, and uh, I actually used the terrain data for itself to make a coastline there, which is vital when you remember that my favorite thing is location-based sound. So in the Hebrides, it's not very quiet. So I might turn this down so it's not loud. Here's a wee teaser of where we're at. Um, the new version, uh, I could show you actually after that, yeah. So here. Yeah. In 5.3, now you can actually see us, we've added all, we've added all the lazy beds in here. And you, can, you can even orientate the run rigs in a random direction. And uh, you can see some of the huts. And some of the biggest challenges is just getting the terrain into the world in a way that it means that it doesn't drop off in the distance. You know, you want to be able to have Unreal Engine and your computing power be able to see the entire world 11 kilometers away. And um, that's where you have to make that negotiation with resolution and the actual world partitioning of the landscape. So we start with the original point cloud, or not the densified one, but obviously the 4,000 images that was captured with the TensorFly EV creating with the point cloud. This is what we started with before moving to QGIS and then onto Unreal Engine. So it turns out that Northwest European geography is quite well documented. So you can find yourself meadow data sets. You can interchange it with others. It's a bit dramatic for the music, but it kind of helped with when you're listening on headphones, the deafening sound of ocean and river. But you can see that we used AI in Pix4D. I could have used Open Drone Map possibly to um, do some land use classification. So we actually created the terrain model, the DTM, to put that into the world so that we can then put the trees back on top, the buildings back on top. And then, amazingly enough, like GIS, slope analysis. So where the terrain goes over a certain slope, we tell Unreal Engine, well, paint it like a slope. And that's one of the sort of many ways in which you can start using Unreal to automate land use. And you'll see the river data sets there, which come with the proximity sound of streams. And then you'll also see the open street map wetland areas as well. So we're able to use that to tell Unreal Engine to actually feed in wetland areas. And this version doesn't yet have the shielings and black houses quite in it, but I'm not actually allowed to show you that till next month anyway. And there's an example of the wetlands. But even when we started presenting this to the archaeologists of National Trust, we were quickly able to differentiate their interpretation of moving through this game world compared to traditional GIS and printed formats. Like when you walk through a settlement, you actually start to see, right, well, maybe this would have been something that's more pottery production or maybe this one on the coast is something that would have likely been more fishing. So the next level is for us to then take a series of artifacts that relate to the actual human living experience to go beyond GIS. 
in terms of what we can create as a game world to now create an immersive experience for archaeology to populate these things to enrich the community that we can allow people to use and actually the first use that will happen is not that we release this as a game for people to play but for a game that archaeologists themselves will give you a virtual tour of so they will walk through um and anyone that's made friends with archaeologists know that they're quite eccentric bunches and, and like to talk very passionately about the worlds in which they're sort of excavating and to have, give them a tool to explore the world will really be a really a good example of the benefit I was touching upon in terms of storytelling while also keeping it true to life accuracy of the real world geography that existed a thousand years ago and so with that I always leave with my favorite part of geography which is the first law which I always part of phrase is you always know and care most about the things closest to you which is why I feel like working together with these types of government and community organizations and teaching them about GIS is the most rewarding because you really get to then translate local knowledge local storytelling into geographic data sets and now a digital geographic open game board with that thank you for listening Short questions before we break off to lunch. Maybe. That would be interesting. Um, game engine. What does it use to populate the vegetation on the terrain? Does it is that like rules set up with regards to on this slope? You said a bit about that. You know, on a slope, yeah. this tree will grow. Or this elevation, or or is it overridden by then that you put into, or is it a combination of both? When you when you first see what the terrain, it creates a landscape actor. And our first issue is that we produce I produce too many landscape actors, and some of them would drop off. So we got it to this one landscape actor that's been produced, and then with that you can create a default paint layer, which in this case I named grass, and then within blueprints unless. Stephen next door here, and I was a wizard at C++ plus as well, like you can hard code it. But then there's Quixel Bridge, there's all these 3D assets that are available to download. And actually some of them even come with the rigging, the skeletal structure to blow in the wind. You're really just creating a blueprint that says grass layer equals this type of grass. And then from that, I add other layers like with polygons to say, right, well, here's the wetland one equals this so a lot of it is um just tiled in a very sort of neat way as well. but one of the things i was looking at because i was starting with the drone data itself when i did the land use classification you can kind of infer things like high vegetation like the classic land use classification categories and so when i was looking at coastal areas for example rocks ai often thinks is either building or like rock surface but when i add that and export it from QGIS as a, an image file. I can upload that with the same GIS plugins to Unreal and then give that a different uh, personality and say rocks itself. You know, so with the terrain, it's really just got one paint layer, the grass, which you can kind of chop and change. You know, you can move it from depending on the you know, the asset that you have. And then the other paint layer for the terrain models created just by slope analysis. And then do that. One more question. Yeah, something that's always fascinated me in Pokemon games, like all the things I about taking a real world and giving it to computer It's how they deal with scale. So you're taking something that's real, that's in your video, first step on really, really fast. I mean, yeah, we, I only had to, the characters all stored now because it's a 21 square kilometer world. We just take you too long for. The National Trust to test it if they were walking at a normal pace. Um, and that's maybe the difference. But with games like Valhalla, they've kind of done a bit of a blend. Like Old Man of Storm is a real scan. The whole island scan and shrunk. It was the same 